Hi everyone and welcome to this fireside chat. I'm Leanna Brinded, I'm the head of Yahoo Finance UK and I have the pleasure of having this fireside chat with Hans Brown. He's BNY Mellon's Global Head of Innovation and is currently a member of the Digital Council and is also BNY Mellon representative on the Asia Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association FinTech Working Group. So we've set the scene for Hans, but Hans, set the scene for us. Let's talk about composable banking and how this landscape has changed. So A, thank you very much for having me. Really, really excited to be here. And as you were kind of reading through that, it just kind of made me think, I've actually been with working with this organization for the last 10 years. And, you know, recently now head of enterprise innovation and as well as the chief information officer for corporate technology. And kind of from my vantage point of looking, you know, running innovation and running the innovation centers and partnerships, it's actually, it's actually been really interesting to see the transformation that's kind of come through and the percolation of what really is essence, the client experience, what we do and how that has become a real transformative piece within, you know, the digital landscape at the moment. And so it's, you know, how do you, how do you get to a point where your enterprise truly becomes digital? How do you incorporate all of those digital DNA, um, DNA items within what you do? Seeing that and being part of that is something that not only excites me greatly, but it keeps me awake at night. And I did kind of smile. This is a fireside chat, and clearly you're probably the closest person with a fireside than, than I do. Yeah, we've got very green backgrounds going on. It's the digital with the nature at the same time. But there is a segue to this because I do feel that with what's happening at the moment, and of course we're in this uh, crisis, how have you seen that intersection of trying to um, have get back to the basics in a way while also trying to innovate when everyone is either stuck at home or in their gardens and the way banking is done has changed? If I kind of think about, you know, when I look at the organization I work for, it's 236 years old, which for me is an amazing achievement. It, you know, it's managed to live through the creation of brand new countries, right from the birth of America as a nation to right now where private companies are looking to colonize space. And it's just that breadth of change has just been. And throughout all of that, the organizations remained relevant. And for me, the way I kind of look at how it's maintained that level of relevancy, this situation we're going through with embedded numbers of people working from home, the way of adoption of business models and so on, this is just yet another disruption that we as an organization are reacting to, and I feel we're reacting really well to. When I kind of take a step back and I look at what Corona, uh, what the current situation has done is, it's given us an opportunity to really challenge previously fast held assumptions over what our operating model and what in, what our attitude and aptitude for digital consumption is. Because necessity has forced us to maybe move towards more digital channels away from the more traditional channels. And also the real blurring of what kind of client experience do I receive in the services I'm consuming at home in my normal life and the services I'm consuming and giving in my work life from the same location as I was before. So that bifurcation of your location determining your appetite for digital now no longer exists. So we're making best use of the best in class tools in terms of how do we collaborate virtually, how do we bring the digital channels close to our clients and help them both on their own journey within digital as well as the consumption of the technology that we have. So it's a really, for me, a really, really interesting juncture. And you know, we're making the best use of this to be able to support our clients in their journey and also take the feedback from that to inform our journey as we go forward. So that's a really good point that you make there. It's about the aptitude and attitude when it comes to moving closer to uh, digitalization, um, correct? But what about action? So we talk about those attitudes maybe changing very rapidly as we've seen the necessity of being, you know, in a way like people may be a bit scared before, but they're now being forced to really lean into it. Where have you seen the action points in areas that, it, when it comes to some innovative um, practices or products, where, oh, let's put a roadmap for the next five years, where have you seen it suddenly change, where it's like, okay, we need to do it now in the next six months? So, I and I will kind of caveat, maybe I've had the benefit in my, you know, in our organization of having, you know, 
organize an organization that has technology operations product and digital working really really well in close harmony and close synchronicity so just you know if i kind of think of our approach as a philosophy of our approach as a actual execution path there's a real intermeshing the real interconnectedness within it so where i suppose i see more of is an acceleration of things that are in flight to produce the bet you know to produce the right outcomes for our clients i've also seen a refocus of how do we make sure that our relevancy and giving our sale our scale and our size within the industry as a whole how do we make sure that that we're able to deploy that for the greater good because at the end of the day if i kind of look at it we're the world's largest custodian we have a responsibility that is bigger than the things that we do you know that it's bigger than as a company too how the world as a, you know how the world basically experiences what it needs to do so i kind of look at the the big thing that i probably would look i'd, I'd call out is we have an approach that i you know that is really built around how do i design around the customer how do i design around the customer and the outcomes the client is looking for so our Omni, for instance, our Omni strategy, which looks like how do I build a global interconnected network that brings the leading solutions, the tools that will help a client scale at speed and bring them all together in one bit. That's something that's really new for us. You know, Omni for us will basically help our clients power what's going to be happening next. How do we basically maintain a relevance? How are we there in the places that they are there and then give them the efficiency and the resiliency to arrive at that possible outcome? Now, this is something that we've always believed in. It's something that we've been doing all of the while. Right now, we're accelerating it because in response to this particular environment, that is what our clients need the most, and we want to make sure that we're there, right there for them. We've also pivoted internally in terms of how do we get our entire workforce to be predominantly based from home, but still meet our obligations to our clients. And if I kind of think, and you know, I have to give huge amounts of kudos to our technology team, the actual pivot and the swivel from basically taking what in essence was a really large in-office population and the technology, the lift out, the build to create that resiliency to allow all of these thousands of people to be able to work from home in a short order without dropping the ball, you know, huge amounts of kudos. You know, our CIO and her team literally batted it out the park. And on the, the same side, when I look at our head of digital in terms of how do we look at the development of an Omni, development of Omni and basing that open partnership, that open network approach, that really integrated approach to being able to deliver the services to the client at the same level of speed, the creation of front office solutions as a new business during this pandemic, that again is something that, you know, is actually really transformative. And I think we probably may not have been able to do this five, six years ago, but now we can because we have the right tooling, we have the right capability, and we have the right attitude. So we are here talking about rebuilding a bank, and you've mentioned that obviously uh, BNY Mellon's been going for 200 years, and yet there's this speed and acceleration when it comes to obviously this new innovative ideas and practices and products for your customers. But not everyone um, would seem to be having that level of progress. What have been the glaring issues that you've seen in the industry maybe where incumbent banks are unable to move at that kind of speed? What is holding them back? Because we talk about necessity, but for some it feels like necessity is just not enough. So I kind of think, I don't maybe look at it as holding, you know, it's not necessarily holding back. I think every part of the industry and everybody wants to do the right thing to come come through to kind of get to the end state. Where I think we have been pretty fortunate is, you know, we've had that intersectionality of, you know, people, processes and tools at the right point in time. So if I kind of think, you know, we have our approach to how we systemically make a resilient organization, how we basically re-update and refresh our technology infrastructure to allow us to move at speed. We've talked quite extensively in the market about our approach to building evergreen and greenfield sources of, you know, greenfield infrastructure to build in resiliency and adaptability that basically then powers the app dev resources to be able to innovate at speed bringing in you know a head of digital to basically reimagine our environment and reimagine the client outcomes and then you know investing really heavily in talent across the organization to bring the right kind of thinking the right kind of mindset in both those organizations i think there's been a real benefits in terms of that the other piece is also a philosophical approach and i kind of mentioned earlier on about our omni about omni 
And for us, Omni is real is a real difference and a real change in the way we think about how we are able to service our clients in an open, have networks that connect interconnectedly that basically allow us to serve our client wherever they are. We also kind of build capabilities in terms of what we have that basically determines where's the best in class outside of the organization and how do we build an effective partnership and alliances capability that brings that in-house and allows us to be able to offer them and basically get them in front of our clients in a way that makes it relevant for our clients and allows them to get to that outcome. So I think it's not one thing. It's having all of the things together that will be, allow you to innovate and move forward at speed. But at its very foundation, you've got to have the right, the right architecture, you've got to have the right technology stack, you've got to have the right mindset, and then you've got to have a willingness and a ruthlessness to execute at speed with a real sense of urgency and iterate to get to you know, a validation of hypothesis. So what I try, where, I, where I kind of get to with a huge amount of my group is, we start off first with a hypothesis. I hypothesize A, B, C, D. These are the test conditions to basically validate or invalidate the hypothesis. How do I basically pivot the organization to front load the risk, to validate the hypothesis, and then move swiftly on? If I can't do that, then all that happens is I take way too long to iterate through the whole scope of that hypothesis to basically validate, is this something I, don't, I want to do or not? And if I look at, we've recently launched a new business called Front Office Solutions. This kind of came out during this entire period where everybody's locked at home, we launched a brand new business. Now, the only way we're able to do that is by being able to have the technology stack that allows us to do that, the digital mindset, the close collaboration with our customers, the hypothesis that says, this is where we want to get to, and this is the value. And then to be able to do that at speed and get it out. So you can't, it's not just one thing. It's unfortunately, you need to have all of it and you need to have the willingness at the top to really double down and then make the best use of the time that you've got. And that I think is what it takes to get there. And thankfully, you know, we are getting there. I don't by all means think we're getting everything right, but I feel comfortable that we're doing more right than more right than you know our peers are. Absolutely. And there's a really good point there that obviously there's lots of pieces to the puzzle where it comes to making this happening. And partnerships, partnering seems to be a key one because that seems to be a way to plug in that gap, that if you don't have that stack and you need that new technology that you can plug that in. So do you feel that the industry is really moving towards, um, and what you've seen from yourself, that partnerships or absorbing those challenges is the next step in the evolution for this kind of banking innovation? Yeah, I kind of think, you know, the partnerships, way, way, way. So, and I think the way to kind of, I don't think, you know, and there was this whole hype a little while ago, the fintechs are coming to eat everybody's lunch, et cetera, et cetera. I actually think I, I was more on the other side. Bringing in capability and fintech capability from outside the organization just makes the pie bigger. It's not one, you know, fintech eat, it just, it makes more pie for everybody. And being able to bring that outside capability in is important. The second part is being able to make sure that you don't throttle that capability once it comes in is even more important because large companies, you know, small companies in these fintech come with a culture of their own. They come with an attitude of their own, a way of doing things, a stack they're used to and so on, which is very different from what you probably might have in a traditional financial services organization. So the partnerships capability also needs to be about how do you grow, how do you nurture and how do you encourage that capability that's coming into your organization without necessarily throttling it and stifling and stopping you getting to the outcome that you wanted to get in the first place. So partnership's really important, but it doesn't stop at finding the partner. I think what's even more important once you find the partner is how do you grow it? How do you nurture it? How do you integrate it? How do you get the best of both as opposed to ending up with the worst of both? Yeah, no, that's a really good point because we've seen some very high profile examples where you have these fintechs that get plugged into an incumbent uh institution and you never really hear from them again or things change i mean what what is that kind of blueprint to making that integration happen because like you said i mean it's not just about maybe the tech stack or the way of working it's also the culture it's you know the processes may be really different so what would you say is that blueprint in making those partnerships actually work for everyone that's an interesting question i'm kind of just thinking back so 
I would maybe summarize it in three. One is approaching everything, you know, architecturally, you've got to have a philosophy you stand for. So for us, our philosophy is openness. We're open to the world. So having and embedding that philosophy and approach of working as part of your cultural DNA of the organization, for me, step one. If you're truly open to the world, you're truly open to feeling and experiencing new things and bringing things that aren't usual into your organization. So that kind of philosophical piece about open, being able to net, being able to build vast networks, being able to integrate, step number one has to be there. The second piece is you need to have a culture that obsesses over the outcomes a client is interested in. And I don't use the word obsession lightly. You know, that real level of obsession where everything you do, you're looking at is what's the outcome that a client will basically see. And I think if you have the openness and you have the obsession with a client, it basically helps normalize and level the playing field because irrespective of how big you are, you're all still pointing in the same direction. And the assessment of every process, every tool, every project, every initiative and so on is, how does this contribute into openness in terms of satisfying my need to be open to the world and allowing me to serve clients wherever they are and how do you you know kind of really bring back in that customer obsession this is going to help the customer get to that then the last piece i kind of look at is leadership across the organization that comes with a digital and technology first mindset and then looks towards how continuously all of the time are you able to create an environment that continuously reinforces so one of the things I kind of look at when I say leadership, that digital mindset, that digital mindset for me is always around how do you continuously create organizations that seek to learn or that seek knowledge, that seek change and, you know, thirst for the change that's coming up ahead. But at the same time, our, state, our resilience and, you know, in effect, what you're doing, the way I kind of look at it is you're taking care of what you have now and making it the best possible thing that you have now while continuously also basically searching for what's coming next so that we can be prepared for it. So those three things, I think, of, you know, that for me is what I think is basically enabling us to do what we're doing well. And, you know, there may be more that I'm missing, but those are the three things that come immediately to mind. Yeah, I mean, that continuous um, search for that kind of innovation, new ideas, things like that, that has to be part of DNA. And, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, and obviously this is very much in your wheelhouse, the innovation centers, right? So how core are those to this whole puzzle on how to rebuild the bank? Like how key are innovation centers? So the, and the innovation center construct is an interesting one because for me, innovation has to happen everywhere. Innovation can't just happen in a special dedicated space with nice chairs and so on. Innovation has to happen everywhere. But at the same time, you do need spaces that encourage and get people to think differently, that get your employees to be able to come out into a space that encourages them to do and explore things that they didn't think of or want to explore further, that want to explore further differently. And, you know, one of the common assumptions I always kind of look at is if you look across our innovation centers, lots of open spaces, lots of white walls, lots of places where we force teams to, in effect, look towards how do we co-locate a particular team in a new way of working, produce really nice, big, open transparency, create an environment where a fintech is comfortable working. That basically says, this is different. Now, once you do that and you go back to your, you know, and you cycle through a process within the innovation center and you go back, how do we make sure that that experience stays with you when you go out? So the innovation center for me is a catalyst to drive innovation. It's not the only place where innovation happens. And I think that difference is really key. You need really good catalysts in order to accelerate that chemical reaction that's needed to really transform the organization. Because without that catalyst, you don't get the multiplicative effect of the transformation. But that chemical reaction to force that to force innovation needs to happen everywhere in the organization. It needs to be, you know, it needs to be innovation everywhere. But having the catalyst is just as important, if not more so, because without them, you don't get that really explosive reaction that gets everybody fired up, that gives everybody, this is different, and forces them to go to the place that's different, and forces them to actively seek the change that is different. That part for me is why the innovation centers need to exist. But the most common mistake I see is 
you know, organizations making the innovation sense is the only place innovation happens. And that for me is criminal. It has to happen everywhere, but you definitely need catalysts. So similar to my previous answer, it's not one or the other. If you want it to work, you need both, you know, and the, the best analogy I have in my head, it's, it's like, you know, a bird needs two wings to fly. One without the other, it's not a really efficient bird. You know, you've got to have really kind of both working together in harmony, that there makes it work. So that part, really, really important. So the Innovation Center is really important for us, but they are really an important catalyst. We do cycle a lot of our clients, we do cycle a lot of our clients, a lot of the fintechs we work through, through the Innovation Centers. A lot of our forward thinking experiments are ran out of the Innovation Centers, but it's a place for everybody within the organization, not a place for the select few. But I mean, like, that definitely, you just describing it, is the kind of excitement that needs to happen when it comes to innovation, right? And especially as workers. And, you know, there may be some people watching this right now coming in completely new to this. It may be, fin we may be all talking about fintech, but there may be these um, areas where they're like, hey, I really want to get into it. Is there, uh, with what you can disclose, just some examples of how those centers have been a catalyst? What, what can be expected in the outcome in terms of deliverables? So we have, and you know, we've got across the centers that we have, we've had a decent chunk of experiments that we've ran, hypothesis that we validated that have gone to spawn brand new things within. So, you know, I kind of look, we worked with one of our Asian clients to basically look at how do we enable them to get to an investment outcome earlier than they had done before. And we spent a decent chunk of time with them. We ideated around the problem. We looked at possible collaborations between both organizations, and we arrived at a point where we're able to decide this is the construct of an API that would allow them to be able to consume the insights that they needed to arrive at that particular outcome. That then becomes something that scales the wider organization, and everybody else gets a chance to be able to use it. We, I look at work that's been done in the ESG space in terms of one of our award-winning ESG apps that's basically come out similar efforts like this. And so, you know, lots of these things are happening. There's work that we're doing in RPA, across RPA, in terms of how do we bring the level of thinking that we have in really deep into the business to be able to get to the outcomes of clients. But coming back to my earlier point, it's something that requires really true, deep, cross-functional teams working together to be able to come to that outcome. Now, obviously, how we work together and how we collaborate together in the physical as well as the vert in the physical world may be different. Future, and also how do we translate some of that into the virtual world? But it's you know there is clearly, as a human society, my personal belief, and this is really my personal belief, is we are best when we collaborate, and the virtual medium is great for in effect sustaining relationships that we have and to some extent for the digitally first natives maybe establishing brand new relationships but as a human species we're social by our very nature collaborating together around a shared objective generally tends to produce better outcomes but it also then requires us to be able to separate out and go and focus and work on generating those outcomes so you know that real bifurcation in terms of together focus together focus but still all pointing towards the same north outcome that we desire to basically get the best both out for us and so you know really really excited about what you know in effect excited about what we've done but also really excited about the potential and the possibilities of how we merge the physical and the virtual going forward in the innovation centers that we're basically we have that's fantastic. And I mean, touch upon that, the importance, as we said before, it's all about people, processes and tools. And I'd love to like hear a bit more on the people side, because as you said, in order for all this to work, for any work to work, it does have to come down to people. People need to be energized. They need to be collaborative, work cross-functionally. When these innovation centers roll out and people, how, how does the process work in terms of getting those people enthused and finding that, you know, building that culture in order to get pe um, people into those centers and therefore come up with these ideas and take that back with them when they, you know, go back to their day job, even though that is part of the job, but you know what I mean. I do. So I actually, and again, another personally held opinion of mine, I think everybody, and I mean everybody in the world, 
is an innovator at heart. The human species, by our very nature, we've only survived this long because we've innovated at every turn. And so I kind of think, so my first superposition is everybody wants to do it. What I've got to do is create an environment where everybody has the psychological safety to be able to do it. And so step number one for us is, how do we design the rituals, the processes around, these are the ways of working within, and I'm going to quote, an innovation project. Step number one is we're looking to do something that we don't know. So there is the possibility we'll learn. It will fail, I beg your pardon. There is a possibility you'll fail. And if we accept the possibility you'll fail, our responsibility is to validate, will it fail as fast and as cheaply as possible? So that we don't pivot the entire resources of the organization in something we know clearly isn't going to. So that mindset shift in terms of actually, it's not we're looking for you to fail because I, I generally, as a rule, I hate this term fail, you know, fast fail. No, what you're doing is you want to learn as fast as humanly possible that this way there be dragons, this way there be gold, this way there is sustenance. You want to find out. And so just kind of how do you quickly pivot your orientation to this is where, you know, there be dragons here. We're not going that direction. And do that really, really quickly. So now we've eliminated dragons here. We can focus on the other two doors. And then let's iterate to, is it this door or is it that door? And so that first, that mindset piece comes in. The second mindset piece that I kind of, that generally happens when people come through a rotation through is working in cross-functional teams is really empowering because everybody elevates their game. And the ceremonies around the ways of working, the introduction of agile techniques and so on and so forth really gets people to think differently. And the third piece is, given the compression of the time to validate, what happens is people become more comfortable sharing more openly. So you know what? It doesn't help me to keep in It helps me to just dump out what do I know and how do I help you? Because this team needs to get to this outcome. So that transformation, the ways of working, I actually believe everybody has it in them. But within the innovation sense, what you try to do is create the environment that unleashes that innate capability within people and get them comfortable with, you know what? It's all right. It's all right to try it because now I know the dragon's there. I didn't fail. I just figured out where the dragon door was and I'm not going there ever again. I'm going to go to the other two doors versus I spend all my effort. I spend everything and I write for the door and I open it and it's full of dragons. Who wants that? Well, except if you're a dragon lover. But the whole idea is, you know, it gives you the whole ethos of, you know, let me look at continuously learning, continuously validating. And innately in people, we want to do that. That's that's what we want to do. That's how as a species, I believe, we're constructed. We want to learn. We want to try. We want to experiment. We want to create new things. We want to gain achievements. That's who we are. How do we help feed that? Fantastic. And so, I mean, we it's been such a fascinating chat and I know that I could speak with you for another hour or so, but we've got just a few minutes left. So the last question, because it's really building on the power of people in order to make this happen, because it doesn't matter how great your technology is, it doesn't matter how great the processes you've built, you need to have people along that journey. And so, you know, just to end off, I'd like to know that with all of this happening, with all this collaboration, but the recentering, and as he said, like the difference in the way we're working right now, and especially everyone's from home, and it's in a way brought people closer together despite everyone found out. <laughs> in terms of that innovation and um, that cross collaboration, where have you seen the opportunities, um, or where have you seen some really great results or new ways of working during this time in those processes, whether it's bringing people that weren't necessarily in innovation centers before or cross region, where have you been seeing those developments? I think maybe in two places. One is the ability for people to focus, I think has increased. So there is something to be said for some work that requires deep amounts of focus and deep amount, having the time away, and just being able to sit in a quiet space in a place that gives you psychological safety, i.e. a home to be able to do that has been really amazing. So that part I kind of put there. The other part is the appetite to consume digital products, I think, has shot through the roof. And I use my mother and my father as an example. I talk to them more over digital means than I have done ever in my whole life. And I make the joke, my mom, yeah, my mom bakes with my daughter. 
now would never have done that in the past. So I kind of look at the, and I use this as a proxy for the appetite to consume products digitally has gone up exponentially. So everything that we do to produce digital products, I actually think that appetite on the consumption side has gone up. And so that I feel two are the real opportunities in terms of the ability to focus and basically hive off some of that focus work, but also on the demand side, the ability, the desire to consume the digital first product has permeated really through all strata of society. And, you know, I make the joke if, you know, people who usually like you to your point, weren't as connected before because they're relying on physical in-person connection now are doing that more so with the digital mechanism than they've ever done previously in the past that basically kind of says that their appetite has increased exponentially now maybe it's on us in terms of how do we satisfy that now built that brand new demand that we didn't have before and that has been obviously been brought out by you know the situation that we're all in and that for me is actually quite an interesting superposition and that i think is how the people have really changed going forward well, that's fantastic. So, but thank you very much. It's been a fascinating chat. And I hope everyone who's watching today, um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And I'm sure if we haven't answered some of them already, then we can get back to you. But don't forget, please stay on with us for the main stage for the lunchtime debate. Where is the heartland of banking? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Leon. I really, really enjoyed talking to you and I'm kind of looking forward for that next session. I'll be in there.